We were relentless in our pursuit of excellence. We went from two stars in the New York Times to three stars in the New York Times to four stars. And it became the first restaurant in the history of the Michelin Guide to go from one to three stars in a single year. We were on top of New York. Number one in the world's 50 best restaurants list from New York, it's 11 Madison We became number one because we made the choice to be as unreasonable in pursuit of how we made people feel as every other restaurant on the list was in pursuit of simply the food they were serving. And so our journey was a ton of trial and error around investing as much intention and creativity into making people feel seen as we had historically into the product we were selling them. Before we dive in, I want to extend a warm invitation to join our thriving founder community. It's the perfect place to discover more insightful interviews aimed at helping you build, grow, and scale your business. So don't forget to hit subscribe. Your support means the absolute world to us. Thank you so much for subscribing. Let's get stuck in today's discussion. Hear the stories, learn the proven methods, and accelerate your growth and future through entrepreneurship. Welcome to the Founder Podcast with Nathan Chan. All right. So, Will, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Uh, the first question that I want to ask you is, what did the first 60 days look like when you started Thank You? Oh, when I started Thank You. Um, that's a less linear answer than I would give for some of the other things I've started. Um, I sold my last company, um, Make It Nice, the company that included a Madison Park and the Nomad and our restaurant at Claridge's about three months before COVID hit. And I imagine many people out there, and by the way, that was extraordinary timing, not due to some sort of knowledge of the world pending collapse. It just happened to work out that way. Um, and like anyone out there who has spent their life building something and then sold it, I, I think many people can relate to this. I immediately had an identity crisis where I wasn't sure who I was if I was not a restaurateur in that moment. Who I was without restaurants was was hard to wrap my head around. And so manically, quickly, aggressively, I started to put together a team, raise a ton of capital and get ready to open a bunch more restaurants. And I was literally, this is not an exaggeration, one week away from signing three restaurant leases and a corporate office lease when COVID hit. Um, moved with my family from our apartment in the city to our place up in the country um, for what we thought was going to be a few weeks. Um, obviously, as anyone who's been alive the last few years can attest to, it ended up becoming a few months and then much longer than that. And in the beginning, I worked, you know, intensely to keep everything that I had just started launching alive. And then one day, realized I didn't want to anymore. Um, I think that anyone who has um, looked back with, with real vulnerability or honesty at what transpired during COVID, listen, many people lost either money or people. We all suffered in some way, shape, or form. But if you look at it in the right way, we all learned something or benefited some way from that moment of adversity. The gift that COVID gave me was the grace and the space to decide um, that I didn't need to go back to doing what I had always done. Instead, it gave me the grace to decide what I wanted to do next. And with that time, I decided to write my book. Um, and that book has just kind of slowly led to so much more, whether stuff in media or the growth of my conference or the advent of thank you where we're working with big companies but it was not like thank you is not a company that i raised a bunch of money for and launched one day it's been a slow evolution over the past couple of years um and so i don't even know what i would call the first 60 days of this one mm. so 
you got me really curious. Um, what happened when you realized you didn't want to do those things that you were doing and, and, and getting, and, you know, starting new restaurants, like where did that come from? What happened? It just, was it just time to reflect or? Well, now to be clear, what I, I've not decided that I don't want to open new restaurants. I think we have a tendency when we're used to doing something to run back and continue to do that. It's not often that people have the wherewithal to really just stop doing everything for long enough that they have the space to choose what they want to do next. That was the big decision I made was to recognize that who I am is not what I do. And I could actually accomplish more in the long term if I did a bit less in the short term. Um, and so, yeah, it was the choice to actually think about what I wanted life to look like as opposed to just allowing life to always look the same as it had. Mm. And was this because the hospitality industry is so intense that you it's hard to take a holiday and you didn't have much time to think and, and disconnect? Is that part of it or? No. No, I mean, I, listen, I've talked to so many people who sell their company and before they're even out of their company, they've already decided what they wanted to do next. Mm. When you're when you're a high performer, when you're an overachiever, the idea of just not doing anything for any measure of time is not even something that very many people consider. Um, has nothing to do with restaurants. I think anyone across disciplines can relate to the story I'm telling. Um, and sometimes I never would have made the choice to stop doing something. I needed COVID to stop the world for long enough that I had no choice but to. Yeah. Okay. So... I guess the reason I asked that question around what the first 60 days looked like with thank you was our, was our community really struggles with what that first 60 days looks like. So it's always really powerful to hear from someone or founders that we interviewed that, that have made it out the other side and have built something of true worth and significance. Maybe we could talk about 11 Madison Park. Like what, what are the first 60 days look like there? I mean, the first 60 days of any new restaurant I've opened – <laughs> I mean, there's some of the most electrifying, exhausting, energizing, exciting, and frustrating days imaginable. Um, you spend all this time developing a plan. You have a very clear idea of exactly what things are going to look like and how they're going to work. And then invariably nothing goes the way you thought it would. Um, there are more struggles to cope with than there are wins to celebrate. And I've opened a lot of restaurants in my life. And so whether it's analogous to childbirth, where you only remember how good it felt to hold the baby in your arms and you forget about all the pain that preceded that moment, or whether it's because, I mean, there are few things that feel better than how bonded the team is after an opening. In restaurants, we have turnover, right? We, have, we, we employ a lot of people. And invariably, six months after a restaurant's opened, the team looks different than it did when it opened, right? Some people don't make it. It's too intense. Some people um, didn't opt out on their own accord. They just didn't have the chops to, to deliver what was required. Um, but there's no team vibe as powerfully connective as the one that exists when you go through an opening together because I believe all of the adversity that comes in those early days just brings people closer together. Um, I love it. I mean, I love every opening I've ever been a part of. Then, I mean, we could also talk about the 60 days after I was given the opportunity to buy 11 Madison Park before I started opening restaurants when I actually started my company. Mm, let's talk about that. Here's the thing. I've come to learn that no one actually knows what they're doing until they actually do it. Um, and I think that's an incredibly liberating thing, right? I think so many people don't start their own company because they don't think they're ready to do it. And then once you actually spend enough time talking to people who have started their own company, is it becomes pretty evident pretty quickly that no one had a clue what they were doing when they started. 
the first time. Um, I had been an employee my entire life, and now I had to figure out how to raise a bunch of capital and source a bunch of debt and start an entire accounting department, a finance team, and an HR department. I have an optimist memory, so I rarely remember the struggles. I think that goes back to the whole childbirth metaphor. Um, but I liken experiences like that to being at the top of a di- like a double diamond um, ski slope. Where the biggest decision you make doesn't happen when you're already going down the mountain. It happens the moment you press your poles into the snow and do that last push that begins the descent. That's the biggest decision. So once you've made that, when you're not walking back up the mountain, you're skiing the rest of the way down, and you may be battered and bruised by the time you get down there, but you will get down. Yeah, one way or another. And so I think actually the first day is the most important day. The other 59 are just, well, those are just a bunch of roadblocks and speed bumps. Tell me about transforming 11 Medicine Park. Like, what did that look like? Any any stories, any bur- like crazy things that you could share? Yeah, listen, when I got to 11 Medicine Park, in 2006, it was a middling brasserie. Um, my do, I worked there for a while before I bought the restaurant. Um, the food was was good, but not great. The service was was friendly, but not very precise. But our dining room, our dining room was truly one of the most beautiful in the world. And I was brought in as a part of the team that was charged with elevating the restaurant experience so that it could live up to the room itself. Now, at first, like anyone, when charged with making something better, I doubled it down in our pursuit of excellence. In the kitchen, we hired cooks that had worked in some of the best restaurants in America. We started sourcing better ingredients, introducing new techniques. We went from a tasting menu or an a la carte menu to a tasting menu such that we could focus more effort on fewer plates of food. In the dining room, we did a lot of the same. Um, hired some of the best servers, removed tables, bought fancier plates and glasses and silverware. We were relentless in our pursuit of excellence. And within a few years, it started to work. We went from two stars in the New York Times to three stars in the New York Times to four stars, which is the most stars. We went from zero Michelin stars to one Michelin star that became the first restaurant in the history of the Michelin Guide to go from one to three stars in a single year. We were, we were on top of New York. We are feeling ourselves. And then one day, I went into the restaurant to go through my normal morning routine. Said hi to the cook. Said hi to the servers. Made mess of a coffee. Went to the back. Started checking mail. And I stumbled on a letter. And in the upper left-hand corner, it said the world's 50 best restaurants. And this is a moment. Anyone is, out there has had these moments that you can recall. Like every part of it so vividly because it was that impactful to you in your career. And this was one of those for me because that list has become very important. Um, It's the first of its kind, the first to rank every restaurant on the planet against one another, which for restaurants like ours that achieved every accolade in our region gave us something more to aspire towards. So I ripped up on the letter and it said, congratulations, you've been added to the list of the 50 best restaurants in the world come to London in June for the ceremony. And obviously we went. Now, the 50 best are a lot like the Oscars, right? You go, it's this larger-than-life auditorium. You're in a room filled with your heroes. You're wearing your nicest tuxedo. But they're different from the Oscars in one significant way. At the Oscars, if you're nominated for an award, when they get to your category, you really want them to call your name. Here, if you're in the room, you know you're one of the 50 best in the world. You just don't know where on the list you fall until you get there. There's sort of 50 that count down to one. Here, you're desperate that they don't call your name for as long as possible. Mm. I remember we had a science seating and something about me, I like to gamify pretty much everything in life. I think it's one of my superpowers as a leader Mm. because I don't care how much you like your job. It will always be more fun to play than it will be to work. Um, People have asked me how I challenge my team to get better and better with each passing year. I always say very simply, I did. not I just made as many elements of the work as possible feel like a game. Anyone who's ever played a game, they like playing, you know, the more you play, the better you get. But I do like to gamify everything. And so I looked at where we were sitting relative to where the people who'd come in number one through five the year before we're sitting to try to guess where on the list we were going to fall. Um, and I think I guess number 35. Mm. 
Um, now, listen, I'm sure because there must have been some of like the normal preambles, the welcomes, the thank you for coming from the big debonair British MC at the front of the room before they started. But I don't remember any of them. All I remember was him saying, let's kick it off at number 50, a new restaurant from New York City, 11 Madison Park. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> we'd come in dead last. Turns out the assigned seating has nothing to do with where you fall on the list, by the way. It's, it's so that they can have a camera trained on you so they can project the image of your reaction in front of the entire room it's what everyone else would pretend to be happy and you're uh, like i was looking like i'd just gotten kicked in the groin um we were mortified just so embarrassed we left the party early went back to the hotel started going through the stages of grief um first anger and i i do like to to dwell on anger for a moment because I think we're in a cultural season where people are so focused on optimism and positivity that we forget about the fueling power of anger. Um, I quote my dad often. One of my favorites of his quotes is that adversity is a terrible thing to waste. You can't control what life throws at you, but you can control how you react to it. Um, I'm grateful in hindsight that we came in last place that year because had it not been for the frustration we felt then I don't think we would have pushed as hard as we did after that Uh, but then ultimately got to acceptance because okay listen here's the deal it's patently absurd to say that one restaurant is the best restaurant in the world there's too many restaurants it's too subjective when you earn the top spot on that list What it actually means is that you are having the greatest impact on the world of restaurants. Um, And so that night I thought about the the chefs that had topped that list before us. And they were all unreasonable in pursuit of their food, their product, and relentless in pursuit of how it needed to change. Um, Innovating techniques, ingredients, sourcing, all of it, such that they can move the craft of cooking forward. Um, that night on a cocktail napkin, I wrote, we'll, we will be number one in the world, but I needed to identify our impact. And what we decided was, listen, if they became number one by being unreasonable in pursuit of product, we were going to be unreasonable in pursuit of people and relentless in pursuit of the one thing that will never change, which is the human desire to feel seen, to feel cared for, or just our collective need to feel loved. And so that's when I wrote the two words, the title of my book on that napkin, Unreasonable Hospitality. Um, got back to the restaurant and then spent the next two years with the team trying to figure out what the heck that meant. But about two years after London, I found myself in the dining room on a busier than normal lunch service. And I was helping out the team. Um, and I, I found myself clearing appetizers from a table of four. There were Europeans on vacation to New York just to eat at restaurants. Um, in fact, this was their last meal. They were going to the airport to head back home straight afterwards. Um, they'd been to the best restaurants in New York. They'd been to like Danielle and Le Bernardin and Jean-Georges and Per Se and now Eleven Madison. But then one woman jumped in and said, yeah, you know what? Though We never had a hot dog from one of the street carts. And it was like one of those light bulb moments from a cartoon where you know the character has a good idea. And so I walked back into the kitchen, dropped off the hot dog, or the, the, the plates, ran outside, bought a hot dog, ran back inside. And then came the hard part, which was convincing my fancy chef to serve it in our fancy restaurant. But I got him to, and we cut the hot dog up into four perfect pieces, added a little swish of ketchup and a swish of mustard, um, a little sauerkraut uh, relish, and before their final savory course, which at the time was a honey lavender glazed Muscovy duck that had been dry aged for two weeks, I brought out what we in New York call a dirty water dog and explained it. I said, hey, I want to make sure you don't go home with any culinary regrets. Here's your, here's your New York City hot dog. And I'd never seen anyone react to anything I'd served them the way that they reacted to that. Um, athletes always go to the tapes and they've had a bad game to see what they did wrong. They don't often enough go to the tapes and they've had a good game to see what they did well to make sure they keep on doing that thing. And so I did with the hot dog. And it required three things. I needed to be present, like basically stop thinking about everything else I needed to do and fully focus on those people. 
I needed to, yes, take what I did seriously, but also stop taking myself so seriously. Like too many companies are so focused on their brand that they don't do things that feel off brand. But sometimes it's the off brand things that will bring your stakeholders the most joy. And three, the whole thing recognized that with unreasonable hospitality, it's not about creating one size fits all experiences. What made that special was that it was one size fits one. And in those three things, we now ha had our roadmap. And our trajectory from that point forward, yeah, we were excellent. And our food was best in class. And our service was as close to technically perfect and all of that. But we became number one because we made the choice to be as unreasonable in pursuit of how we made people feel as every other restaurant on the list was in pursuit of simply the food they were serving. And so our journey was a ton of trial and error around investing as much intention and creativity into making people feel seen as we had historically into the product we were selling them. So that was a crazy story. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, so much to unpack there. I'm curious, you know, for our community that are typically early stage founders, how can they stay present in the moment with their customers? What can they learn from that? Well, I think the lesson there is that the more you pursue your customers rather than just talk at them, the more you can get to know them and the more you learn from them, the better equipped you are to serve them in a way that they actually want to be served. I think a lot of early stage founders make the mistake of only investing time and energy into things that are scalable. I think if you limit your efforts into scalable ideas, you're selling yourself short and holding yourself back. I think we need to invest energy into unscalable things. And then once we've figured out how impactful those things can be, then invest some time and energy into figuring out how to scale at least a part of what made them work. Mm. Yeah. I, uh, there's a great quote that I love by Paul Graham. He, he talks about in the early stages, do things that don't scale. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, and, uh, you bring me back to like when we interviewed Joe Jebbia, the founder of Airbnb. And, you know, when they first started, something along the lines of um, they had like a, like some sort of um, conference that was in San Fran. And uh, what they did was they actually put their own place up. That was like the first Airbnb and they like got to know the person that stayed there and they kept doing that. They, they just did like, they just, they just put up places themselves and they got to know every single customer in the early days and they did things that didn't scale. So I can really resonate with that. And I mean, a lot of people would say that investing in people is not scalable, but it is. Maybe you start it with things that aren't scalable, but the underlying idea very much is scalable. You know, a lot of people talk about like, what is their moat? Every business is trying to create their moat and everyone does it or talks about it at the very least around the idea of product and brand. What is it about the product? How good it is? Or what is it about the brand? How strong it is that will prevent someone else from coming in and taking their lunch. Um, the reality is, and this is not a theory, it's a time-tested fact, that no matter how good your product is, no matter how strong your brand is, eventually, it's just a matter of time, someone will come around and build a better product or create a stronger brand. It may be because they have more money or they're just smarter or more creative or maybe they're just younger and so they see a part of the world that you no longer have the ability to see. I believe the only true competitive advantage, the only real moat that exists comes with investing consistently and generously into relationships because relationships take a long time to build and if you build them in the right way, the loyalty you earn 
takes a long time for someone else to erode. And so if there's anything that a founder of a new company could learn from our story, it's you can't focus on the product at the expense of the people. And because I believe we're, we're in a place where excellence is merely table stakes. I don't think you can get to the top without doubling down on hospitality. So how can you do that in a digital sense? That's the full question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you need to give me a lot more than that, man. I mean, it looks different depending on what the product is. Okay. For, so for, I reject for... that question. I'm going to tell you to do a better job on that question. <laughs> okay. So how can, let me explain. How can you do that in the digital sense when you have an e-commerce business, when you're selling a physical product, like how can you really take your lessons from hospitality and, and connection and, and building relationships at scale or building relationships even like we, when it comes to people? I mean, there's plenty of examples of people that already do. Um, you look at Chewy. Do you know what Chewy is? No. Chewy is the dog food company um, or maybe it's just pet stuff company. But a lot of people will go to Chewy and they'll order their dog food on automatic reorder. So it just comes at a relative clip and you can get toys for your pets, all this different stuff, whatever you need to, to care for a pet. Um, when you have a recurring dog food order, that means that when your dog passes away, you need to call and cancel them and let them know why. And oftentimes when someone's pet dies, they don't, immediately think to cancel the food order. So a lot of the time, the call that Chewy is getting is, hey, I just got this bag of dog food. I don't have a dog anymore. Can I send it back to you and get a refund? Chewy has systemized into their product a couple of things. One, they can't take dog food back, so you just they let you keep it and they encourage you to go drop it off at um, a place locally where they can give it to someone in need and they give you the idea of where to go. Um, and then everyone on the receiving end of those calls, because listen, in most digital companies, there is a call center. Those call centers are their dining rooms. They are empowered to go above and beyond to make people feel good in those moments. The automatic thing that happens, unless a human being overrides it with a more creative idea, is you get flowers sent to your house automatically saying we are so sorry for your loss. That's unbelievable and connective. And the people who hear that story tell about it or talk about it nonstop when that's happened to people. And yeah, that costs money. It costs Chewy money. Um, but I would imagine this is for them as it always was for me. Every dollar I ever spent on hospitality was much more impactful than any dollar I ever spent on traditional marketing because you give people stories like that to tell. Guess what they do? They tell them over and over and over again. And then suddenly you wake up one day with legions of ambassadors out there doing your marketing on your behalf. Mm. I think you can, you can bring connectivity and relational investment into any business. And by the way, it's never hard. It just requires trying a little bit harder and caring a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, what a great story. You bring me back to um, uh, a couple of stories in my mind, actually, of founders that I've interviewed in the past. Um, one who I ended up becoming friends with, he started a company called July. It's a, a, They do suitcases and travel travel stuff stuff for traveling and um my partner at the time she ordered one of the suitcases and there was something wrong with it and she sent an email to customer support and the founder actually popped by our place to to fix the suitcase because he was in the area and it's an e-commerce business who does that yeah, that's amazing. It, 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 like we ended up becoming friends. He ended up teaching a, a course on our platform and he's an exceptional founder. And that company post COVID is, is one of the, yeah, the fastest growing companies in Australia. It says a lot, right? 
Yeah. That's definitely not scalable. No, no, no. But but the idea behind it very much is scalable. Graciousness and care is scalable. Perhaps the way it was expressed in that moment is not. But the underlying idea behind it is. Yeah, I love that. So, Will, you strike me as someone that's a, a really, really incredible storyteller and leader. And um, you talked about your team and unreasonable hospitality and writing the book and how you how you like to motivate your team through making everything into a game i'd love to explore that more Good. um i just don't think there are many things that you can't gamify if you don't try hard enough um i have always made it a point to bus a lot of tables no matter how many restaurants i owned no matter how whatever celebrated my career was when I was in the restaurants, I bust tables and I did it for a few different reasons. One, because that was where I came up from and it's my comfort zone Two, as a meta signal to everyone in my company that regardless of where I was in my career, I wasn't getting carried away with myself or thinking that I was too good for even the most menial tasks and three because well honestly if you actually want to know what's happening in your business spend as much time as possible with the people at the very front of the front line otherwise you'll never really understand what's going on um, and so because of that i was always close to the bus boys and so whether i was in la or vegas or new york city or london when i was in a restaurant i'd be busting tables and every time i'd spend a night in one of the restaurants i'd go up to one of the bus boys and say tonight it's me versus you Whoever clears more of your tables first wins. And I would always lose. They were better at it than I was. But that wasn't the point. The point was to show them and everyone on the team that if something as seemingly mundane as clearing other people's dirty dishes could be fun, everything could be fun. I think that the more something feels like you could never make a game out of it, the greater opportunity there is to figure out how to. Um, I don't think it exists across the board. So what does the winner get? Does the winner always have to get something? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't even matter. No. I mean, bragging rights. Yeah, I beat the boss or whatever. Drink at the end of the night. You can come up with games, but it's not about the prize. Like people go out and they play like trivia at their local pub or the I don't know what you ever win when you win those things. What you win is that you won. And by the way, not all games are competitive winning, losing games. There's plenty of games that you play as a team when you're racing against the clock. I think it's about creating stakes and giving people something to, to celebrate or to laugh about. Um, and I think it exists all around you. It's just a matter of, of looking hard enough that you can find it. Hmm. So what compelled you to write your book? Once I made the decision to rather than going back to doing the thing I'd always done, to choose what I wanted to do next. I decided that writing a book was a really helpful way to help me get there. Um, I think that when you're trying to choose what road you want to walk down next, rewalking the road you've been, you've just been down is healthy and allows you to rediscover or perhaps even discover for the first time what about it you loved the most and want to repeat and what about it you didn't and don't want to. I also believe the best way to learn is to teach. And the better you are at articulating your core values and non-negotiables, the better you are at leading people to embody and embrace them. And I knew that if 
I forced myself to really put everything I believed into a book, it would make me that much better at bringing all those things to life in my next chapter. That's why I wrote the book. What I didn't expect was for the book to almost become the next chapter. Yeah. So you sold, you said um, your, your stake in, or your co- former co-owner of 11 Madison Park. Why did you, and, and other restaurants and then COVID hit, why did you decide to do that? My partner and I weren't, were just not in love anymore. Um, it was not working in the way that it, it had. And we spent a very long time going back and forth and trying to figure out who got to keep what. Mm. Um, and then one day I just had this realization that, I mean, this has been going on for months that in an effort to keep part of what I had built, I was part of kind of tearing apart the thing that I had built. And I realized of the two of us, I was more well-equipped to just build something again. And so I just said, buy me out. Hmm. And there's something amazingly liberating about that. Um, My dad often, you know, gives me all sorts of kernels of wisdom. One of the ones I like is that when you choose to do big things in your life and in your career, there's going to be a bunch of challenging moments. And every time one of those comes about, just ask yourself what right looks like and do that. If you make the decision to always do what right looks like, you really never have to make another decision in your life because while so much of life exists in the gray when it comes to what's right and what's wrong, it's normally relatively black and white. Hmm. Um, and that was what right looked like then. And I look back on it with zero regrets. All right. Well, look, uh, this has been great. Um, I could speak to you all day, uh, but we have to work towards wrapping up. Uh, we have to move to the hot seat round. Rapid fire questions and answers. I'm ready. What's your death row meal? A bottle of Conterno Barolo and a double-double animal style from In-N-Out Burger. What was the most surprising guest that walked into your restaurant? Or one of your one of your many? <laughs> um, Paul McCartney and Jimmy Fallon at the same table. What daily habit makes you a better founder? Journaling. I journal every single day. For a ton of different reasons, I believe perspective has an expiration date. The better you are at capturing your perspectives through the seasons of your life, the more easy it is to tap back into them. Um, and every time I journal, I either come up with a new idea, realize there's someone I need to apologize the next day for something I did incorrectly that day. There's always things that come out of it. My journaling hack, though, is this. Um, I hate exercising. I do it, but I hate it. And one of the things that got me to consistently do push-ups was a friend of mine saying, hey, just make me a promise that you'll do one push-up every day for the rest of your life. I was like, I can do that. Now, the reality is there's no excuse to not do a single push-up, no matter how whatever hungover you are or tired you are. And once you're on the ground, you're going to do a lot more than one. Mm. With my journaling practice, the only thing I commit to doing is just writing the date. I have to open up the journal and write down the date. Same idea. It's probably been three days in the last year that all I've actually done is write down the date. Um, You always write more once you're in there. But it's just about creating a practice. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. Those daily habits or daily practices as a founder, if you can get that right and it compounds over time, it really shapes where you want to be in the future. 100%. What story that you share in your book still helps you in your work today? I mean, so many of them. I think... um, The story of writing... The same night that we came in last place on a cocktail napkin that we would come in first. I think it's 
my dad gave me a paperweight when I was a kid. It sits on the desk in our other house still to this day. It says, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Um, he's challenged me over the course of my life and my career to answer that question honestly, and whatever that honest answer is, just to try to do that. Saying that far too many people are scared to say their biggest goals out loud for fear that if they do and don't achieve them, they'll let themselves and those around them down. But if you don't have the confidence to dream your biggest stuff out loud, you're not going to achieve it. Um, I still look at that paperweight and hope I will continue to for the rest of my life to make sure that regardless of what I've already accomplished, I don't stop trying to do new audacious things. If you could have dinner with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Henry Ford. Um, just because I'm low-key obsessed with Ford and the assembly line. I don't know there's a lot of bad stuff about that company back in the day, but um, I just think what he did is is pretty extraordinary and... And I would just love to learn more about how it all actually went down. And where would you eat? At In-N-Out Burger with a bottle of Conterno Barolo. We're on to something with In-N-Out. They did a pop-up in Brisbane uh, last week. Not in Melbourne, but in Brisbane, Australia. Yeah. All right. That's annoying. So close. What are you excited about next? Last question. Um, I'm writing and producing on a show here in the States called The Bear. Um, and I'm really excited to start doing more of that. I'm, I've loved television my entire life. I think a lot of what goes into being a great restaurant operator and what goes into being a great TV and film producer is the same. And that will definitively play a big role in my next chapter. Amazing. And uh, one last question I just have to ask. Uh, what are your final words of wisdom or parting advice for our community that you'd like to share of early stage startup founders? I would, I would repeat something I said before because I believe repetition is, is important. If you believe something, you better say it so many times that you grow sick of hearing yourself say it, otherwise you haven't said it enough. Now, Excellence in your product is table stakes. And you need to be as invested in relationships as you are in that product. And you need to apply the same creativity and intention in your people, those that you work with and the ones you serve. As you do in doing the groundbreaking work to conceive whatever product you're bringing to market. Love it. Well, Will... Thank you so much for your time. You're a really, really exceptional person. And I don't say that lightly. I, I really enjoyed this interview. Thank you so much for your time. And, and uh, thank you, Nick. I uh, look forward to seeing what you do next. Thanks for having me on. If you love this episode, make sure to check out my interview with Emma Greed on how solving a problem she was so passionate about led to the creation of Skims and Good American. And so I do think it's so much of it starts with like addressing things that bother you, that you find, you know, you've got to create a solution for, because, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to be passionate enough and sometimes crazy enough to go round and round and round to actually solve a problem.